Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Smarter Traffic and Transportation Planning Session today with Wejo. Um, thank you to all the attendees who've joined us today. We really appreciate it. And um, today we'll be talking about how to boost operational control with connected vehicle data. So I'd like to introduce you to the team that will be delivering the session today. So first up is myself. Um, my name is Steph Ayres. I am the SVP of Channel and Enterprise Partnerships here at Wejo. Um, I've been here for over three years and seen a huge transformation in the way that various organisations use connected vehicle data. And previous to Wejo, worked with um, data and analytics um, quite significantly um, with offering solutions to the retail sector um, in conjunction with Nielsen Analytics. And then I'm joined by Francis Perez, who is our senior data analyst. And Francis loves big data analytics and real world problems. She is part of the team developing Wejo's intelligence products and using her expertise in mathematics, geospatial analytics and applications of new technologies. And last but not least is Matt Blackwell, who is our AVP of Solutions Engineering. Uh, Matt Blackwell is our longest standing member of Wejo on today's webinar. He's been with us over four years. And as a solutions engineer, he matches up the requirements of a client with the capabilities of connected vehicle data. So really, really great team here with you today. And um, we're excited to talk to you um, about how connected vehicle data can help solve um, problems in this sector. So very, very quick bit of housekeeping. Um, please ask any questions throughout the session using the Q&A function. Um, we will save some time to answer those questions at the very end, but keep them coming in um, fluidly as they, as they pop into your mind. Um, we will be sending the presentation out afterwards. So if there's anything that you miss as part of today's session, please don't worry. We'll be leaving our contact details and sending the presentation out. Also, one thing to be conscious of is if you do use the chat function, you'll be visible by all attendees um, unless you select to be anonymous. So just looking at the agenda for today, um, we are, first of all, looking at some of the priorities for the traffic and transportation industry. And we'll also talk about how it can be a challenge to access the data that you need. We'll then introduce you to connected vehicle data before talking about some of the solutions it offers, um, as well as real life examples from existing customers. So Matt, over to you to kick us off with today's session. Thanks, Steph, and a really warm welcome um, and a good morning for, to everybody attending today's, today's session. So I suppose just to kind of kick us off, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with WeJo's kind of mission statement and, and USP, Really, this slide is just to, to introduce you to what we're about as a, as a business, for those of you that don't know. So we do, we are the, the global leader in connected vehicle data. You know, we ingest data from millions of connected vehicles um, across the world. So we have agreements globally with major OEMs. Now, we work with public and private organizations, such as some of the ones who will be on today's session, really in you know things like transportation planning industries, they include traffic management and, and traffic solutions providers, but as well as the kind of more local authorities and the government um, based agencies, really with a view to helping make journeys safer, smarter and greener, and really to help our, our partners drive those business efficiencies. So, you know, we know um, what your challenges are. You know, we have customers every single day that tell us what's important and what the challenges are to, to them. So we've kind of picked out three, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. But if we look at, you know, for example, the first one, which is around safety, you know, that lends itself very, very well to what we understand around the Vision Zero initiative, which is a global initiative. But then also when we start to look at congestion and environment management and how you know, a lot of the bills that are coming out from the government level really lend themselves to really tackling congestion in a big way. And then finally, around securing projects. Obviously, we all know that, you know, securing projects is in, in some in some cases inherent on actually having those data sets that support winning those projects. So with that, what we would ask as a first kind of um, interact, interactive piece to, to this session is to have you guys kind of vote on which of those is the most important to you in terms of your priorities and challenges, or actually it might be none of them. So I'll just quickly launch um, the poll here. And if we could ask just as, a, as initial ask just for everybody to vote on which of those areas is most important to them. Um, so I'll just give that 20 seconds or so just for it to allow everybody to, to vote. Okay. 
Okay, so we are seeing the results coming in and uh, no no great shock for us. Um, safety comes in at, at number one and that very do, does lend itself to kind of what we're hearing from the from the industry around, you know, tackling safety. Safety is always the number one in terms of priorities for, for any business that we speak to. So a real surprise there. So thank you. Now, second to the challenges is around, okay, so we understand that there are data sets out there that are able to, to help us to, to tackle these issues. Um, but actually, what are the main barriers that prevent you from kind of achieving those, those goals? So again, when we speak to a lot of customers, they typically will fall into kind of, I suppose, three camps, which will will have Francis talk to a little bit more detail in the presentation, but that's around, you know, the data accuracy and the integrity, the speed of which that data is available to be able to make kind of near real time decisions around traffic management and also boosting operational efficiency and really minimizing the amount of outlay on, on physical infrastructure that's needed to, to monitor safety and to monitor congestion. So um, very quick fire in terms of the polls this, this morning. So kind of keep you on your toes. So I'm going to launch a, a second poll, which is going to ask now kind of of those issues that we've, we've suggested around the accuracy, the integrity, the speed, which of those is most important to you? So I'll just quickly launch this, this second poll. And if we could just ask um, everybody to just quickly vote against what's most important, or it might be other. Okay, so looking at that, so um, the most most popular um, is around data accuracy, and again, no real surprise for us. And, and Francis will talk a little more around this in terms of how how the accuracy of of connected vehicle data lends itself very very well to confidence in the data and being able to make decisions. So thank you for that. So I kind of taking it back up to to I suppose a helicopter view around what is connected vehicle data because it's a very very basic question, but it's one that we get asked um, time and time again. You know, connected cars really are, are part of the Internet of Things. And, and you know, the Internet of Things, I'm sure everybody is aware, refers to everyday items. It could be your mobile phone, it could be devices, and it could be cars in this instance. So we do employ no aftermarket retrofitted device. This is a feed that comes directly from the head unit of the vehicle. Now, you know, nowadays cars are built at the point of manufacture with hundreds into the thousands of, of individual sensors that are actually embedded within the vehicle when they're manufactured. Now, those sensors collect everything from your vehicle in terms of diagnostics to um, driving behavior. And so those connected cars are collecting, you know, millions and billions of data points every day about the vehicle, and actually sharing that to the cloud. And that's where we come in as a, as a business. Now, as a final slide before I kind of hand over um, to my colleagues, really, you know, again, the question comes in around how does Weijo fit into that ecosystem? So as you can see on the, on the left hand side here, we have the kind of data input around, you know, vehicles that are transmitting information to us constantly um, from, from all of our OEMs. Now, where we do fit into this is we are able to take in that data into a common data model, standardize all of that data, and really be able to provide that in a, in a variety of different methods, whether that be as a stream of data, whether that be as predefined packages, whether that be as you know batch data for, for kind of control periods, which is really important when we start to look at a post-COVID period. And on the right-hand side, we have our kind of, again, not an exhaustive list of end users, both public and private sector, in terms of the users of that data. So with that, um, I will hand back um, over to you, uh, Steph. Thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, connected vehicle data as a solution. So first of all, we felt it really important to first highlight some of the key challenges that we hear time and time again from our customers. And it's really interesting to see, with the, see some of the outputs um, coming from the poll today and how they marry up. Um, so specifically around safety and specifically around data accuracy. And we'll talk to those in more depth as we go through the session today. And, and thanks, Matt. The introduction to connected vehicle data offers a great segue um, for Francis and I to start exploring some of the solutions um, that connected vehicle data can offer. So let me start off by talking about data accuracy and integrity. If you could just move on to the next slide. Thanks, Matt. 
Um, so accuracy um, is the key reason that companies and organisations such as departments of transportation and civil engineering firms are starting to integrate connected vehicle data into their mix. So our customers tell us that having the confidence, um, as you did today, um, in their data sources to make data driven decisions is helping them to stand out from competition and make a positive impact, whether that's by reducing congestion or indeed by improving safety. Um, again, as we've recognized in the, in the poll earlier today. So just to be really, really clear, when we say accurate, we're meaning in terms of accuracy when compared against the reality of what's happening on the road. And we'll talk a little bit more about customer testimonials um, further, further through the session. But one of our customer repeatedly, customers repeatedly say to us, um, the vehicles know more about the roads than we do uh, because of the granularity of this data. Um, so through assistive technologies like differential GPS, um, accuracy of our data is greatly increased, meaning that you can be certain that the car's position on the road is very, very close to the truth. So Francis, I believe you're going to take us through some examples. Can you hear me fine? We can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I just want to start off with uh, one of the commonly known uh, location data provider that I think everyone will probably be more aware of, which is mobile device data. So, you know, as we um, grow as humans and with technologies, um, there's more and more people owning smartphones, uh, which we take everywhere and frequently. I know I always have my phone with me. Um, now, the location data from this um, mobile device data are representing more of um, people movement rather than vehicle movement, as we can see on the left hand um, image there. So you can see, you know, people are going to buildings, going to different places. And we also don't know whether these people are, you know, walking, cycling, or people who are car sharing, you know, someone who is just driving using their and maps. So um, you can see that there's a lot of noise there, you know, you're, you're not sure whether all those people are just on the road, you, you're not sure whether, where they're going, basically. Um, if we compare this to connected vehicle data, as um, Matt have explained earlier, uh, these are coming from cars. So this is data that's coming from the GPS location uh, due to the GPS um, capabilities of the cars um, coming from the vehicles themselves. So you can see that all the dots that represent a car and you can see that they are all on the road. Um, what this means, uh, so that for the people who work with data uh, day in, day out like me, you can see that, you know, you don't need to classify the transport mode because they are actually just coming from the cars. You know, you don't need to dynamically sample because one car is one car and uh, you don't need to take into account the different phone models or correct for any potential issues around signal strength and positioning precision. And, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Steph, but our partners or customers have told us time and time again that we've, uh, they have to filter out less than 1% of our data. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had several customers feedback to us now where when they use traditional um, data sources, generally they filter out around 40% of data points, as you can see on the image on the left. Um, when you're looking at a traffic related use case, some of those data points aren't applicable. Um, but yeah, I mean, to be precise, Francis, we've got customers who say they have to filter out less than 0.004%. I always have to think how many zeros are on the end of <laughs> point there. But yeah, absolutely. And you can imagine the amount of time um, and processing cost that saves an organization. Definitely. Um, we're going to go through another example now, which I think just hammers home how useful connected vehicle data because of its accuracy. So. Um, if you play the video, Matt. So at the start there, we could see um, Paris. And um, at the start, you could see the coverage there. And you know, you could see that the minor roads are even covered. Um, as we play through it, you could see the bar graph at the bottom where um, there's more and more cars on the road. You could see it increasing now and you could see more cars on the road and the video there. Um, another thing to point out in this uh, video is just as it zooms in, you could see the dots which represent each car and they are colored by speed. So you can see that red is slower speeds, um, yellow uh, around the slower speeds as well, and green is just faster speed. And if we go through the next slide. <clears throat> All right. So this is just zooming into Arc de Triumph. And uh, many of you will know that 
of the triumph is the busiest roundabout in Europe. Um, I've not been myself, but I've heard that it's quite scary to cycle around there. Um, and similar to the previous um, slide again, you could see that each dot is coloured and you could see there, you could see from when cars are approaching the roundabout and um, they are slowing down. And with video data, you don't only know that they are slowing down, you could actually find out how far away and how much they are slowing down as well. And I think this becomes really, really useful, especially with road safety, with identifying um, if there's any problems on the road, whether we can improve, for example, signage or warning signals, if there's any problems. Anything to add there, Steph? No, I think you've covered that really nicely, Fonso. Good. Okay. So we're talking here about um, speed of visibility. And again, when we were on the poll earlier, this was also very important to the audience. So visibility for our customers is about being able to access the data that they need when they need it. So this could be by location or it could be by sensor groups. And the need could be in for, for that data to be in near real time to support with emergencies or real time traffic analysis. And it could be through historical data for planning and measuring the impact of a collision or analysing general driving behaviour to see how road networks can be improved. And frequency of data is critical for visibility as it relates to how often a vehicle's position and other sensor data is updated. So data is provided to us um, in almost real time and is stream processed by us to ensure the highest quality and to include useful metadata such as reverse geolocation. Um, and by virtue of the quality assurance we perform, downstream consumers receive data which is highly accurate and requires no further processing for it to become directly useful. And Wejo data is updated every three seconds. So you can imagine how granular that gets. So this translates to a highly accurate data point every 40 meters or less in an urban environment. So being able to spot a sudden, a, a sudden slowdown accurate to 40 meters could save valuable seconds in acting and isolating the problem area. So for example, applying a specific road si sign or traffic calming measure in a specific location. And again, Francis, over to you um, as our data expert, just to show us some examples. <laughs> yes, Steph. Um, so this one is one of the areas that we have analysed. Um, if you follow through the lines passing through the roads there, you know, those represents each car and um, the red just shows them slowing down almost uh, most of them to a stop, actually. Um, so this shows about 69 cars um, and this um, is just something that we've analysed where well. we've seen a simple collision turning quickly into a major pile up. As I said, about 69 cars piled up into a queue. And you could see that um, if you follow the red dots there, you know, you could see that they are backing up and it, the queue becomes longer and longer. Um, you can clearly see as well that, I think it's zooming out now, where, where the cars are going as well, where they're diverging. And um, one of the major positives about connected vehicle data is you could see not just a particular road, so if there's a collision, you could identify which roads will become busier and therefore we could update, for example, warning signals that other roads are busier, not just the one where a collision happened. So receiving real world movement data in almost real time after generation empowers those interested in a rapid response, response to act, um, rerouting vehicles away from the scene, as I've said, and to avoiding um, compounding issues and keeping the network moving as well as possible. And um, personally, I think being pro proactive is always better than being reactive. So, you know, um, things like this, analyzing what has happened and how um, we can improve and how to react or how we could avoid it in the future is very important. So advanced knowledge of a pulse of higher vehicle density approaching can allow us for timings to be adjusted ahead of time and thus avoiding um, queue formation. So um, I'll move on to this slide. Uh, so this slide, uh, just explain it a little bit. You've got the vehicle speed on the left-hand side there and then harsh braking events on the right hand side. Um, so if we start off with the top circles, um, the top circles there just shows the speed prior to the braking event, which is about 86.5 kilometers per hour. And then uh, you could see um, on the right hand side circle, the first 
breaking event occurred like 260 meters. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know any other data set that will tell me quite easily and quite quickly that um, you know someone is slowing down this far away from a junction. And that's just very um, similar to the bottom one as well. You know, you could you know as well the speed that they go to when they slow down. And therefore, um, if you imagine this, when you're analyzing it, you could actually identify, is that slow enough um, for the junction to be safe enough to be um, traversed? Or do we want people to slow down a little bit more or a lot further? And if we move on to the next slide, Matt, um, you could just see here that um, if you add the knowledge that we've got on the road or any other uh, data set that will empower connected vehicle data as well. Um, you can see, for example, the top left-hand side there, road signage is at proximity of the first detected braking point, which means that we know that people are slowing down when they see the sign. Um, therefore, if we think that it's not far enough, we could move it back up further and make sure that people are um, slowing down a lot earlier. Therefore, probably will have a slower speed when they approach the junction. Um, another interesting thing about this slide actually for me is pa passing underneath elevated roadway. I know that when I uh, drive, I actually do slow down for those things, but I actually just realized, oh, actually the data is showing that, um, which is really interesting. And I think it's something that just shows, you know, it's not just, you can see new insights, but it could also validate what we think and what we know we do as drivers. I think I'm just moving away a little bit about um, speed and braking. So this is a bit of a different example where we've got um, some weather sensors and temperature sensors. So the first thing to uh, just highlight here is the colors obviously represent sensors. So the, or the temperature, sorry. So red is a bit warmer and blue is a bit colder. Uh, one of the things that we did is validated the data from a, an external data source and they are of very similar ranges. Um, however, you might ask, why is that important? You know, we do have weather data everywhere now. Like there's loads of apps, there's loads of websites. Um, I think one of the main selling point for this is it's isolated to the road. And, you know, if you think about wiper sensors, um, other sensors that could help identify people slowing down, traveling really slow, um, you could probably tell and uh, if we work with um, you know, data science, for example, you could identify roads which, which are icy. Therefore, you could help um, adjust the warning signs, for example, or maybe even just tell people in advance that, or in real, almost real time, that these roads are icy. Therefore, be careful. Therefore, drive slower. And I think that really hammers home the message that you know there's a lot of sensors there with connected vehicle data that could be useful, especially for road safety. Thanks, Francis. So as we move on to talk about operational efficiency, bearing those last couple of things in mind that you talked through, Francis, I just want to link us back to what Matt spoke about earlier in the session today. So we know that some of the manual processes and some of the data used can hinder operational efficiency. So filtering data is one prime example that we've talked about today. And connected vehicle data brings some really unique benefits that can boost operational efficiency. So Francis, not too much of a break for you. Um, handing back over to you to talk us through this in a little bit more depth. Uh, just before I go in a bit more depth, I was just going to say as an analyst, I spend so much of my time filtering the data, you know, um, one of the figures that keeps coming to me is like 80% of my time um, I spend when I'm analyzing data is cleaning. But that's before I went to EJ because with connected vehicle data, as we've highlighted before, uh, we don't have to filter as much data because I wouldn't say it's 100% clean, but depending on the use case, you know, it's a lot less. And it, instead of cleaning the data, I spend a lot more time manipulating it to the use cases that I have uh, to generate those insights. So I think I really like this slide just for that. Um, so the first thing I just want to highlight is speed of access. So this is referring to how quickly we access in highly granular and accurate insights about near real time traffic conditions. And, you know, as we have um, said time and time again with those examples, um, you could get the connected vehicle data in near real time, in which, which means you, know, you could act quickly and responsibly. 
Um, another thing is automation. So I know uh, with a lot of the data engineers I'm working with, um, this is quite a big thing. And um, automation, um, if gathering the data is not automated, you know, it could be time consuming and it could be more error prone to um, which but connected vehicle data you could um, if you automate getting the data it's a lot quicker a lot faster which can accelerate your project you know it reduces resource requirements as well and it reduces risks and um, it promotes efficiency it facilitates growth and it reduces the cost uh, by minimizing the manual processing around the data collection as well uh, which i think it's just really good um the last thing on there is uh, reducing the time and effort required to gather data i think I've rambled on enough about uh, editing the data or cleaning the data. So I'm not going to give you too much detail about that, but reducing the time spent in the field, collecting the data as well is, I think, quite a big thing because um, connected vehicle data gives you insights that um, basically, basically cannot be gathered from other data sources except the ones that you know are a little bit more, I guess, needing a lot more cleaning. So, and it maximizes productivity to make data-driven recommendations as well. Thanks, Francis. So we're moving on now, and this is kind of where, where my passion lies in terms of, you know, I, I'm customer facing and there's nothing better than hearing testimonials like this from, from customers. Um, and let, unless the, the, the customer drives value, then um, there is no value in it. So um, the Indiana, Indiana Department of Transportation and Purdue University um, are, uh, long time customers of Wejo and we've been working with them now for around two years. Um, they use connected vehicle data to analyze intersections. So this is a really, really recent example and I'd encourage anybody to um, look at some of the articles that have been released by Purdue University. They're available on our website. Um, but this, this testimonial is as recent as last week. So they have managed um, to get the time it takes them to identify an intersection down to four minutes. Um, so they can carry out a month's worth of analysis on a specific inter intersection within 45 minutes. That's a month's worth of analysis, all using Weijo data. And the best bit about this feedback was when we asked our contact at Purdue University, how long did it take you previously? They said it previously took two to three years um, due to putting the right infrastructure um, in place, gathering the right data, quality checking and control, and then analyzing it, as Francis has just said before. Um, and the speed they can do it at now and the accuracy they get is changing the way that they can deal with um, and identify problems within cities. So it also helps with prioritizing where the most problematic areas are. Um, so when I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation that one of our customers always says to us, the connected vehicle data know more, knows more about the roads than, than we do, um, it, it's, um, it's Purdue University who say that to us repeatedly. Um, so I'm going to lead into Matt now to introduce us into more real life examples about how connected vehicle data is being used, but I hope that was, was really helpful. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, so I think what's really important when we start to look at applications of the data is actually how this data maps to, to real life examples, real life applications and real life use cases. So what we've done here is we've kind of selected just a, a small subset of, of kind of industries and verticals to, to focus on here. So the first of which being kind of the, the transport and infrastructure vertical. So I suppose some kind of use cases and applications in this in this area, are things like ITS modeling, things like tra active traffic management and dynamic signal timing. And as we can see on this video here, this is just a really good example of how the data maps um, to one of these use cases. So the use case being, okay, if we were to implement a road diet on this, this downtown area here, how does that impact the surrounding areas? So we're starting to look at not only how does the data actually help around you know the road in question but what impact does that have around you know surrounding areas so if we were to take 50 percent of traffic off this this main arterial road where does that traffic go what impact does that have on the surrounding areas in terms of speed in terms of of congestion in terms of stationary time so the transport and infrastructure is a really really good example as well of where we can start to boost those operational efficiencies that we talked about previously 
So whereas, you know, there's, there's a lot of inf expect, expensive infrastructure that needs to be implemented. So things like induction loops, um, closed loop sensors, even some kind of, you know, smart CCTV and AI, we're able to be a supplementary data source to those, um, those particular methods of data collection at the moment. And also, do, you know, kind of provide that accuracy that a lot of the, the transport and infrastructure networks are used to. Now, the second one that we're going to look at is is a, an area for us that's that's you know increasingly more and more important, especially when we start to look at some of the initiatives and the models that are being implemented for whenever it is as a, as a post COVID period. So, you know, because of the fact that we have access to a very very large historic data set, we can start to look at those control periods of you know kind of pre COVID, during COVID, and soon to be post COVID. The things like you know work zone management so work zone management is a really really good example of how the government and the public sector are utilizing the data for okay what impact did that work zone have on the you know in terms of were there residential areas that would suddenly get large areas of um, volumes of traffic that wouldn't have seen that before in addition to that as well a lot of the the government's space have to do travel demand surveys in terms of understanding the origin and destination of different journeys now, because we capture every single journey from ignition on to ignition off, we can actually start to track those really, really short journeys that typically aren't captured within a lot of travel demand surveys. So certainly the government, and the public sector is an area that we are seeing more and more traction in and more and more call for data driven results. And then as a final area we wanted to kind of focus on was the kind of GIS and location data space. So this lends itself very, very well to, for example, a retail setting. So we speak to a lot of large retailers and a lot of kind of consultants for large retailers who want to look at things like, where do I position my next site? Where can I look at my average catchment area in terms of the journeys for that area as well? So what we're viewing here is kind of some incoming and outgoing journeys. So the incoming journeys being visualized in blue and the outgoing in, in purple. And what we're able to start to then look at is hopefully you can just about see that the red dots there. It, as a really good example, this could be a large retail park where you can start to understand at the point when a vehicle actually enters that, that area, how long is it taking them to park? Do we have an issue with congestion in the area that we can, we can actively manage and, you know, a lot of retailers are responsible for the traffic they potentially inflict on an area and are in, in a lot of cases fined heavily. So they're looking for new data sources to be able to verify the efficacy of any traffic calming measures that they put in place. And obviously the, you know, the big piece around this as well is that origin destination analysis, which I've mentioned previously. Thanks. Matt. With that, back to you, Steph. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, we're here today, obviously, to talk about um, a specific sector, but also um, Wejo is now live with connected vehicle data in Europe. So some of the attendees today might be more familiar with um, Wejo in the US. So we've been operating in the US now um, for many years and we're an established leader in the connected vehicle data space. Um, some really, really kind of big numbers and key statistics along the right hand, uh, sorry, along the left hand side there are that in the US, we've got 11.3 million active vehicles from a, a, over a 50 million vehicle supply base. And in terms of what that translate to, translates to, that's over 391 billion miles created, um, 10.1 trillion data points and over 48 billion journeys. And we're quickly ramping up that vehicle coverage in Europe now already with vehicle coverage available in the likes of France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and the UK. And then to give you some quick statistics um, on the right-hand side there, we can look at last month, which tells us that in the UK, we collected over 346 million data points with 1.2 million journeys. In Germany, we collected 970 million data points with 3.3 million journeys. And then we've got in France here, um, we collected over 3.6 billion data points with 10.5 million journeys. So in terms of what that tells you, um, that's an awful lot of data, an awful lot of information that can help you drive some of those decisions. But our planned growth over the coming years is exponential. 
um, as more connected vehicles come off the production line and we onboard more OEMs across um, across Europe onto the WeGeo Adept platform. And to give you an idea of that scale, we expect to have up to 9 million vehicles in Europe by the end of 2022 and over 140 sensors available. So some of those use cases that Francis took you through earlier with regards to identifying temperature and, and so on and so forth, um, we unlock more use cases and we unlock more value. So working with private um, and public organizations in the transportation planning industries, you know, including traffic management and traffic solution providers, as well as local authority and government based agencies, we're really, really able to unlock a variety of, of, um, of solutions there. So without further ado, um, I'd like to open up for um, the Q&A. Um, before I dive into that, I just want to draw your attention to the info um, at email box. Um, so if you have any qu queries or questions relating to today's session, please feel free to um, email us and we will respond to you. So in terms of questions, um, I've can see that we've had some come in throughout the session here. So I will start off with the first, um, which is over to you, Matt. Is the source of WeGeo data solely connected vehicles? So yeah, to re and again, it's a question that we we get a lot in terms of you know what's the makeup of the of the the car park we'll call it of the of the data set. So we do have purely connected vehicles and when we say vehicles we mean passenger vehicles in this instance um, now that's really important to us because as i mentioned earlier if you start to look at things like um, the covid travel patterns with a lot of the fleet management providers that we that we speak to they didn't really see much of a drop in terms of their overall volumes of journeys and that's because you know freight and, and logistics does not stop um, even in times of, of COVID. Now we did see quite a large drop in the in the, the number of journeys and the number of data points um, and active vehicles during COVID. And that's really important because that gives a lot of organizations the ability to analyze true commuter patterns for those kind of models, which are gonna form the basis of, of any kind of ITS models for the next five years onwards. Thanks, Matt. And we've got another one here, which is, um, I think we've kind of touched on it, but we could dive into it in a little bit more depth, is how good is your data coverage? Is it a good sample size for traffic flows, for example? So Matt, Francis, um, feel free to take that one. Yeah, I'm kind of happy to, to, to come in on this one. And then Francis, if you've got anything to add to. So so it's in terms of how good is our, is our data coverage, I think this, this kind of comes back to the the because of the makeup of the of the fleet we see coverage on not only the arterial roads but when you start to look at the secondary roads the the functional road classifications you know one and two that's where the data comes into its own so typically in areas where it's not possible to monitor traffic patterns because you know of, of expensive infrastructure that's needed we have that good coverage now in terms of that sample size as steph mentioned before that will only grow over time so as um, legacy vehicles start to come to end of life and start to leave the road, you know, the connected vehicles that come connected straight off the production line will only start to grow that sample size and that fleet size. Yeah, and I think the second part of that is just, is it good sample size for traffic flows? Well, the, it's literally cars on the road. So, you know, when you analyze it, you know, the traffic flow, it might not be every car in the road, but it's definitely a good enough sample to identify whether it's, um, cars slowing down or speeding up or whether there's congestion as we've seen in some of the examples earlier as well. Thanks Francis. Um, there's another question here which I think I'm going to take. So what type of organisations typically use your products? Um, so we have many, many organisations that use WeGeo products. Um, we've talked about today the likes of departments of transportation, um, civil engineering firms, but also broadening that to uh, mapping and navigation <clears throat> organizations um, or even logistics companies who are looking to improve their delivery times. Um, so a whole range of use cases can be driven from connected vehicle data. And actually there's one question that's just dropped in that links to this, so I'll cover it off at the same time, which is can connected vehicle data help improve delivery ETAs? Um, so, 
Yes, they absolutely can. And to give you, again, another quote from a customer that we have recently um, provided our vehicle movement data to, um, they um, validated that they could identify up to 30% more roadways or route to their customers. So the connected vehicle data not only um, shows more route, but it shows them quicker um, once they have, say there's a new roadway that's opened. Um, as soon as a vehicle um, that is on the ADAPT platform drives down that road, um, it immediately identifies that roadway as a viable route. So yes, absolutely is the answer to that question. Um, okay, so... Um, do you have connected vehicle data from across the world? So, Francis, I'm going to direct that one to you. You're often one of the first people in Weijo who sees data coming in um, before we're able to create product for our customers. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes. So as you've, as you've said earlier, Steph, we've got a lot of data, you know, trillions of data points in the US. And now we're just coming into Europe with the you know with UK, Spain, uh, France, Germany data as well. So those are the ones that we definitely have at the minute. I know there's some probably coming down the line, but you uh, US and Europe, yes. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and we've got a couple of minutes left here, so we'll 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 go into one more question, and then we'll then we'll wrap up, and we'll make sure that we follow up with anything else that we have missed as part of today's session. Um, but Matt, I wonder if you can tell us how do you deliver data? We've got a question here asking if it is an API or if there is a website. So could you just talk to us a little bit more about how we supply the solution or the data to the customer? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, to data delivery, you know, we, we have multiple ways of, of being able to, to deliver that data. So, you know, if, if we pick up, for example, on the API piece, so yes, we do have APIs available. So at the moment we employ a HTTP push API. However, we will be um, launching kind of developer APIs more towards the, the end of the year, which work on more of a kind of REST API call basis. Now, you know, aside from APIs, when we start to look at a lot of the cloud solutions providers, we are pretty much cloud agnostic as a business. So we can deliver data through any of the major cloud um, providers. And also, you know, we have a lot of experience in terms of being able to deliver data straight into big, big data analytics tools as well. I think aside from that as well, what we will be starting to look at is, um, as again, we, we move more towards the end of the year, being able to actually um, provide a platform that can be interacted with, that kind of is very much focused towards the, the kind of ITS engineers and traffic engineers um, who need a UI or a UX to be able to, to engage with. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matt. And with that, we are on time now. So um, I'll conclude by wrapping up and just saying a huge thank you to the speakers today and also to everybody else who attended. Um, so again, if you have any questions at all about Weijo or connected vehicle data, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and please use the info at email address. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.